Uh, tonight's concert uh, and lecture were made possible by a generous grant from the Anne E. Leibowitz Foundation. Neil W. Levin, the Anne E. Leibowitz Visiting Professor in Residence in Music at YIVO, has directed and devised this evening's concert. Neil is one of the world's experts on music of the Jewish experience and is Professor Emeritus of the Jewish Theological Seminary and longtime Artistic Director of the Milken Archive of Jewish Music. As the Leibowitz Visiting Professor, Neil works with YIVO's immense archival collection of Jewish music to help us bring to the public the incredible gems of this vast trove of musical treasures. Those of you who don't know, uh, the, the YIVO Institute possesses the largest collection of, of, uh, of materials from Eastern Europe and Russia uh, relating to the Jewish experience of almost a thousand years of any repository in the world. And, um, and Neil helps us bring these materials to the public and you will hear some of these magnificent treasures this evening. I also wish to thank the American Society for Jewish Music, the Jewish Music Forum, and the Jewish Music Forum for their support of tonight's program. A note on the program. No book exists on the phenomenon of classical art songs in the Yiddish language. Tonight's program booklet and pre-concert lecture are not just elucidating for an enjoyable evening. They are an important scholarly contribution, shedding light on this chapter of Jewish music history, which deserves to be more widely known. The music you'll hear this evening does not exist in recent publication or critical edition. It needed to be collected from a variety of old sources with its transliterations, updated translations made, and in some cases, new arrangements composed. To be properly performed and presented, this music required Neil Levin and a team of helpers, chief among whom is our program manager, Alex Weiser. Uh, to be properly performed and presented, it required Neil Levin and a team of helpers to produce these texts in context that you see in the two program booklets you each have. It is our hope that having done this work, we can give this beautiful, important music a new life and to spur performances of it around the world after this evening. We are particularly indebted to Alex Weiser, YIVO program manager and composer in his own right for these notes, the program booklets, and the work he has put into tonight's performance. We are also very indebted to the beautiful design work of Alex Brandwine, uh, Evo's graphic designer who produced tonight's program. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. You know, a little earlier this, this evening, we were having a little run through for the performance. And an acquaintance I had suggested to come and enjoy the concert was here a little earlier, took a look in the room, and I was upstairs there, and uh, she said, I thought you said this was going to be a Yiddish song evening. I said, no. I said, well, there's just a piano on stage. No. And those microphones look like just recording mics, which happens to be true, by the way. Yeah. And she said, I hear the singers warming up, but that sounds like it's classical music. To which I said, getroffen, the closest to bingo I could come. Because in fact, this is a classical Yiddish song recital, except for the, I would say, uh, high calorie and high cholesterol dessert at the end of uh, some Yiddish theatrical entertainment. It is devoted to classical Yiddish song, which is analogous to the leader tradition or the art song tradition, which means that it is solo voice and piano in a chamber music duo 
where they are equal partners in expressing serious poetry. Strictly speaking, I suppose leader might be held to refer specifically to the romantic German variety with analogous repertoires in other languages, you know, French, uh, Russian, Czech, English, American, so forth, called art song. I don't like that term because I think that it conveys uh, and kind of unwanted stodginess and almost affectation. I will probably use it interchangeably with leader tonight simply because we don't really have an acceptable alternative yet, just as there is no real equivalent in English of the word leaderabend. Some people have asked me about that. Uh, it's become an international term for a classical song evening just song evening wouldn't do it unless you specify, but Liederabend does. It's like lots of words. In German, Zeitgeist, can't translate that. In an English sentence, we would say Zeitgeist. Uh, in French, if someone uh, is perceived to have a, a certain je ne sais quoi, we're not going to translate that. It can't be translated unless you have a few sentences. In Hebrew, I personally never translate bracha. It doesn't mean blessing and it doesn't mean benediction. Translate it as in, in, in a two sentence footnote, but the word is bracha. And finally, mechutten? How about that one? It doesn't mean in laws. Most of you know that. So we, it doesn't matter if it's an English sentence. We have to use it. Now, a significant part of this evening's program is devoted to songs by Lazar Weiner, who was the supreme master and the most sophisticated composer of the Yiddish leader or art song genre. And his son, Yehudi, is our pianist this evening. So I thought I would share with you a little recollection, which is around mid-1970s at a meeting of the uh, now defunct National Jewish Music Council of the Jewish Welfare Board. I don't know how many remember that. We were having a meeting to pick the theme for the annual Jewish Music Month that year. I was a very junior member. Lazar Weiner was a longtime member. And he proposed Yiddish music, by which he didn't just mean uh, art song or solo song. He meant a vast repertoire of Yiddish choral music, not only his own, but a vast repertoire of many composers. There was tremendous opposition on the council, mostly because they felt that it would not resonate at, at that time across the country. That schools, Jewish schools, Talmud de Torah, community centers, synagogues for special services just would not uh, pick up on it. Remember, this was mid-1970s, the renewal of interest in things Yiddish across the country, certainly outside New York, hadn't taken hold yet. So Mr. Weiner became very agitated. And he stood up and he said, you see, that's the trouble with the Jewish people today. Jewish people needs its own country. It was 1975. He said, if we had our own country, things would be different. And everybody looked at each other. And Eric Werner, the great musicologist of Jewishly related music of that time, stood up. His background was German Jewry, German speaking Jewry. He had no appreciation for Yiddish culture anyway. And he looked across the table and he said, Lazar, what are you talking about? Have you never heard of the state of Israel? What do you mean we have our own country? I'll never forget Mr. Wein stood up again and he said, oh, yo, 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 that, that's, that's very nice, but that's not what I mean. <laughs> we all knew what he meant. He loved Israel. He loved the Hebrew language, but emotionally, if it wasn't Yiddish that was the language of the country, the primary language and cult culture, it wasn't Jewish, it was nicht Yidin. So where did this genre all begin? There's a kind of a paradoxical answer to that, 
which was that it began in two places independently of each other, Imperial Russia and the United States. Chronologically, the first was what we call the new national school in Jewish music, born in the first decade of the 20th century. Its embodiment was the Gesellschaft for Jewish Volksmusik, uh, Society for Jewish Folk Music in St. Petersburg with branches in Moscow and Riga and Odessa and other cities in the empire. Many of you know quite a bit about this. I bring it in just as a background. Uh, the composers uh, who were best representative, Moses Milner, Krein, Alexander Krein, Joel Engel, Michal Gniesen, Lazar Saminsky, Solomon Rosowski, Jacob Weinberg, and a host of others. But here and among them, Yiddish art song leader was born, and they were not Yiddishists. They were not Yiddishists. In their pursuit of cultural national Jewish consciousness, they were equally interested in Hebrew and Yiddish. So for them, in their original songs, yes, these are the first Yiddish art songs, but they also wrote a lot of Hebrew art songs. They were equally interested. So therefore, the Hebrew poetry of Bialik and Tchernikovsky and Imber was equally important to them as Peretz or Raisin or Jaffa or Rivasman and so on. The other arena is almost the opposite, right here in the United States, a little bit later. Initially, with virtually no awareness of what I call the Russian episode, composers began to create Yiddish art song, Yiddish leader, inventing it anew as co committed Yiddishists. Uh, their primary focus, if not their exclusive focus, was Yiddish literature and culture, and Lazar Weiner belongs very much to that phase. So although Yiddish leader would become only one part of the music produced by the Imperial Russian episode. I'll begin with a few remarks about that because it preceded the Yiddishist classical leader development in the United States. It was the new national school of composers who first conceived the very notion of intentionally, and I emphasize intentionally, Jewishly related or Jewishly based classical music of any kind, vocal or instrumental which is to say a classically oriented music directly born of some authentic Jewish experience related to such experience and so on. Prior to that development, there had been no such genre as Yiddish leader in the Western classical understanding of leader, only Yiddish folk song, theatrical song, yes. But there had been no wider tent of intentionally conceived Jewishly related classical music, and certainly no school, even if there were a few exceptions, and there were, but the exceptions imply the rule. And the exceptions aren't even mentioned in Grove's dictionary, they're really obscure. So consider that apart from that, that the entire 19th century produced only two works of intentional Jewish connection that entered the classical music canon, by which I mean something that the music world knows as standard repertory. doesn't mean everybody knows the piece, but they know about it. What are the two pieces? One is instrumental. The Kol Nidre by Max Bruch for cello and orchestra, commissioned by the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic, written by a non-Jew, and one operatic, Halevi's La Juive for the Paris Opera. If we consider the 19th century to extend, non-chronologically, but um, in every other way, really to the beginning of the First World War. Then we'll add Bloch's Shlomo, Rhapsody for Cello and Orchestra, but that's it. And I'm gonna preempt any questions or misassumptions in advance about Mendelssohn's Elijah, because it is a completely Christian oratorio in every respect, a libretto that has its pre-Christian roots, not in the Tanakh, not in the Hebrew Bible, but in the Old Testament of the Christian Bible, which is not the same thing. And the Messianic components 
are all from Christian perspectives, which I'm not criticizing. It's hardly inappropriate for a composer who was a Christian and biologically, and I suppose halachically, a Jew. But what we want to understand is the roots of most of this evening's program, and not only the roots, but the impulses behind them. What were the forces behind this new national school? First of all, the Russification movement. The Mighty Five, or the, the Big Five, the Russian Five, for Russification of music and a de-emphasis of Germanic influences and an emphasis on one's own, in this case it was Russia's folklore for classical music, all of this had a tremendous influence on Jewish composers at that period. Similarly so with the national composers of East Central Europe, Dvorak and Smetna, and later Kodai and Bartok and so on. Uh, the interest in collecting folk music, which had become a Russian almost obsession in certain intellectual circles, gave a kind of impetus to a Jewish interest in collecting folklore from out in the hinterlands, from the Pale of Settlement. I think the most complicated force driving this creation of a classical Jewish-related music, which did begin with Yiddish leader, by the way, that was the first form, is the recently emerged at that time and newly heightened awareness of a cultural nationalism, consciousness, which in turn led to a form of Jewish nationalism, in some cases even eventually political. Now if we focus on that aspect of a driving force, there are some very interesting but very unsuspected comparative correlations that one can make to, of all things, the rise and development of the original model, the German lead, roughly a century, a century earlier, without any intentions of being a model for anything Jewish 100 years later, of course. And these correlations also apply to what I call the German leader's subsequent offspring, French art songs, Russian, Czech, Norwegian, English, American, so on. They all had to do in terms of interest in that genre with national pride. The 19th century romantic German leader have been interpreted as a um, kind of collective genre as actually a function of German romantic nationalism. I'm talking about Schubert, Brahms, Schumann, Hugo Wolf, and so on. And nationalism, which in turn was partly a function of the German romantic urban intellectual discovery of the folk, discovery of folklore. Richard Taruskin, the eminent his historical musicologist, has gone even further. And I'll quote him. He said that the answer to the question of the early Romantic period, period of what is German arose most clearly in the Romantic lead, a genre that was inspired by that burning question of national identity. Sound familiar? Maybe a coincidental pre-echo of a question that I find kind of tiresome by now, which is, what is Jewish? What is Jewish about a particular work of art? Or anything, a particular food item for that matter. To appreciate the correlates between the forces behind the romantic German leader tradition and those that drove the unprecedented early 20th century creation of modern Hebrew and Yiddish leader repertoires in Imperial Russia, we have to turn back to the thinking of the 18th century Prussian preacher, cum social philosopher, folklorist, Johann Gottfried Herder. He elevated local and regional folklore and folk song in German-speaking lands to subjects that were even worthy of urban intellectual interests in the first place. These folk cultures in combination would later be capable of serving as a binding force 
in a pursuit of German nationalism. Herder even coined the phrase folk song. Volkslied in German for folk song. Previously, there was no such word. Those songs were called what, what we know of as, or think of as folk songs, were called either rustic songs, peasant songs, sometimes just simple songs. Now, consider the analogy. The discovery of the Jewish folk in the Pale of Settlement by the urban Jewish intelligentsia in the very beginning of the 20th century. And in that case, this led to the founding of the new national school, which became the incubator of Yiddish art song or Yiddish leader. Beginning in the 18th century, it was the German so-called discovery and appreciation of its folklore, which was essentially a, a notion of German romanticism. And this helped plant some of the seeds of German nationalism, and this romantic national thought manifested itself in the leader genre. It's a nationalist thinking that is now understood as both a resentment of longtime French condescension and a resistance to French attitudes of cultural and philosophical superiority, of course, as seen through the French Enlightenment lens. And I think it's worth noting that the height of German resistance to Napoleon coincided with the childhood of the prime exemplar of the German lead, Schubert. And it's also from this period that a germinating German nationalism gave rise for the first time really on this level to these notions of German superiority of German music. It stems from this period, not earlier. And that attitude in itself grew out of a type of inferiority complex up against French attitudes of superiority prior to that and coincidental with it. And by the way, this notion about the superiority of German cultural uh, music and German culture persisted among German Jewry every bit as much as, as among uh, non-Jewish Germans until very, very recently. Though born of different circumstances, the Hebrew and Yiddish leader of the Russian New National School also bespeak transparently social cultural nationalism which is to say, in the end, Zionism in one form or another. Now there's also the non-negotiable inseparability of language from leader or art song. This too dates to the German lead, the German case. Dates to the seedlings of romantic nationalism in Germany, or German lands. But it extended to all of the other orbits as well. So, what does this mean? It means that while opera, for example, may be subject to legitimate opposing arguments about its production in translation. If you know me, you know where I stand on that, but it does uh, leave itself open to a legitimate argument on, the, on either side. No one would responsibly propose to perform, let's say, Schumann's Dichterliebe, in French, not even in France, not even in France, where just recently a complaint against a pet shop was threatened, a complaint to government authorities because the pet shop had a parrot that didn't speak French. <laughs> I'm not making it up, you can't make this stuff up. And some of you know that in France, um, if there is any permitted language on signs, store signs, restaurant signs, whatever, in a language other than French, and there are only certain exceptions, it must be in much smaller size than the French lettering. So no one would propose doing leader or art song of any language in another language in translation, not even in Montreal in French, where some of you may remember, I think it was in the early 90s, the police took all the Manischewitz matzahs off the shelves everywhere because it didn't comply with the law. There had to be French labeling. Now, I, 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 
applaud the desire to maintain language and culture, but episode Sufil, no? <laughs> anyway, for the new national school composers too, Jewishness resided, I'll say, resided in the language of their songs, be it Hebrew or Yiddish. That was what made them Jewish. And these were what I would call, all of these composers were secular ballet tshuva. They came to this not having a command of Yiddish or Hebrew in terms of a spoken language. Russian was their spoken language. They were Russified Jews. If they had a second language as an intelligentsia, it was German. And this was new. In America, even the uncompromising Lazar Weiner wrote one of his best known works, Bunch of Schweig, to an English translation of Peretz's story. But he would never have sanctioned the performance of art songs or leader in any language other than the original, which was the Yiddish, because he would have said, opera, okay, this is not uh, high literary material, which is true. But in doing any leader or art song in a language other than with that which they'd been composed defeats the whole notion of the poetry being the primary point. It defeats the point of the pianist expressing the poetry as much as the singer. It sidesteps all authenticity and renders the poetry as well as the music impotent. Weiner was attracted to poetry of all types and all schools and poets of no school uh, in the Yiddish cultural arena, but he was particularly attracted to two schools here in the United States, which was where he discovered Yiddish literature and Yiddish culture, even though he was born and went to school in Kiev. He wasn't born in Kiev, but he went to school in Kiev. One of these schools of poetry was called the Inzich School. This included a, a group of people, a coterie, that valued a modernistic approach based on personal experience in their poetry. It also included as one of its founders the person who had introduced Lazar Weiner to Yiddish poetry in the first place, totally coincidentally. Nachum Borch Minkoff. The Inzichists um, became a, a source of learning and knowledge and cultural awareness from the very beginning for Weiner. So for example, the song that you will hear tonight, I have a secret for you. That's an Inzich poem, deeply internalized immersion in a kind of visionary infatuation, brooding mood, brooding communion, overflowing with an anguished frustration of self-spun dreams, which of course vanish immediately upon awakening. The sweet secret in this poem is but one word, an ein, an ein sick wort, but it's never revealed to us in the poem. The exquisite concluding line suggests a probably fruitless but perpetual search for a kind of imagined reality and an idealized vision. And I, I still seek your hallowed place, dein geheiligt ort. A different kind of frustration permeates another Minkoff song that you won't hear tonight. I know, I think you will, still a tenor. I confuse it all the time with his song, still a licht. That's the one you won't hear tonight. Still a tenor, in which the poet expresses that the hushed tones of a gloomy sky that precede a downpour of rain are his dull tones of an overcast heart. The other of those two movements to which Weiner was so powerfully attracted in the United States 
was known as Die Junge. That was founded in 1907. It included a group of young immigrant writers who valued form over content, and they sought to remove Yiddish literature from political, social, and even moral agendas. They saw Yiddish poetry as potentially a pure universal art form that did not necessarily have to have a greater purpose. So for example, tonight, you will hear Zisha Weinper's Teuben. It's a deliciously, but I think a deceivingly simple setting by Solomon Golub, which suggests that the gloom of human loneliness might be alleviated for a very short time by inviting two white doves into one's home apartment uh, from their perches outside. Then there's Aaron Nissenson's ethnic, um, ethnically and religiously neutral poem, which became one of Lazar Weiner's best known songs, Volt mein Tata Reich gewen, If My Father Were Rich. This is nothing if not surreal. I would say even hallucinatory. You judge for yourself. You have the translations. The sun is captured and then put back up to hang. However, another of de Junge's desiderata was freeing Yiddish literature altogether from restriction to specifically Ju Jewish or Judaic subject matter. Yet, when you hear the song tonight, Yossel Klezmer, note the overt Jewish references and the scene in the poem by Naftali Gross, one of the de Junge poets. You have a shtetl celebration with a badchen, a klezmer, and these are images that Weiner was drawn to and which he amplified musically. Now, of course, one could interpret these images merely as symbols or metaphors. You then have reference to the dancing waves in the sea, which might be interpreted as humanity's helpless inability to control events. But more intriguing for me in the same poem and therefore the same song is an invocation of an inherently exclusively Judaic religious image. The Kise HaKovod, the Almighty's holy throne on which sits the supreme judge and where in Olam Haba in the next world. And of course this refers to Yom Hadin, the judgment day which permeates the Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur liturgy. It's also described in the Yom Kippur liturgy as the Kisei Rachamim, the throne constructed of mercies, El Melech Yoshev Al Kisei Rachamim. On top of that, in this poem, you have the folk who are now in Olam Haba, who in life danced to Yossel's music, and now they are going to be witnesses for his defense in the holy court. I suppose it's possible to interpret all of this alternatively as a kind of gentle mockery of traditional Judaic beliefs. I don't think Weiner did so. Somehow, such religious imagery appealed to Weiner, a self-proclaimed anti-religious secularist, which is a term I, I still don't understand, but a very spiritual one. Indeed. And yet many of his songs are peppered with Jude's Judaic, not just Jewish, but Judaic religious allusions in poetry that inspired him to explore its artistic possibilities. Just a few examples. In a Stille Licht, the rabbinically ordained Lichtbenschen, mention of God as the creator, one who destines marriages, no less, and a line of admiration for Torah scholars. And that's also a de Junge poet, Mani Lieb. Or the Tfilleruf, the call to prayer, in another song, Fun Weite Teg, where it says, God, comma, God who hears us. I find it unavoidable to hear an echo of the phrase, Kiato Shomea. That occurs in the concluding 
bracha of the Shofarot section on Rosh Hashanah. Ki shomea, for you hear. A futter to sein Sohn, there's a reference to Shema Yisrael. In tonight's beim Benchenlicht, it's not just that there's Benchenlicht, but you'll hear the phrase, a Shabbos blend, a Sabbath glow, a Shabbos glow. So once in the 1970s, at the end of a long discussion I was having with Lazar Weiner, it was a combination interview, and then it ended up being a long, long discussion where he talked about his life and his growing up and his childhood, but he also emphasized that he was not observant and he was opposed to all religion. In those days, you heard the phrase organized religion a lot. I always wondered whether that means that our religion is disorganized. I mean, I don't know. But uh, that's the way he spoke. And uh, I will tell you that it was only a kind of age-appropriate Derek Heretz, a little bit of intimidation also, that prevented me from responding how I wanted. Because what I wanted to say was, Mr. Weiner, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that you're not religious. Then I also wanted to say, you know, Mr. Weiner, you just spent a lot of wonderful time telling me about how you sang in the choir of the great synagogue in Kiev. And there are pictures of him as a child, but not only a chorister, but a boy soloist with a high cantorial hat and cantorial garb, which all chorus members wore, even in the United States at one time in traditional synagogues. And I wanted to say, you sang in that shul with many important chazonim week after week throughout your childhood and your early teen years. You know, there is a saying, I want to paraphrase, a saying about yeshiva, yeshiva boys who leave yeshiva and try to shed the experience altogether in later life. And if I'll be permitted to paraphrase that, I would have said to Mr. Weiner, you can take the boy out of the shul. You can't always take the shul out of the boy. I don't mean to imply by any means that Weiner's songs in the aggregate are confined to religious content. They're about all sorts of things. He wrote I don't know, between two and 300 songs. My only point here is that it was one part of a devotion to Yiddish literature from which he never shied away. I want to make two other points. We might even get to some Q&A if you have time. I don't know. Um, there is no reason that a Yiddish leader or art song need be confined to Jewish artists, except that it isn't available in understandable form. One will say, yes, but the Yiddish culture has so many idioms. Every language has idioms. That would be my inclination, too. However, consider the following. Who were the three, I would say, undisputed greatest Wagnerian sopranos of the 20th century? Kirsten Flagstadt, not a German or Norwegian. Birgit Nilsson, not a German, a Swede. And Helen Traubel, an American born in St. Louis or Kansas City. I don't know, I always mix them up. Who was the great Norma of the post-war era anywhere in the world? Joan Sutherland, not Italian, Australian. You get my point. The materials have to be available to those who have a gift for languages, a gift and an ear for the nuances, which includes some and excludes others, but that's true with any language. Nobody can know all languages um, who wants to sing lead. I remember Hans Heinz was one of the great voice teachers at the Juilliard School. 
And he used to hold separate classes just for pianists who might be interested in leader or art song. And he would tell them, look, if you are interested in this genre, then you need to study perfectly, not just pick up in a few words. You need to know French and German to start with, and then Russian, and so forth. Uh, but still, even the pianists can't learn every language in which leader have been written, Norwegian, Greek, Czech songs, and so forth. So the same could apply and should apply to Yiddish songs. And finally, some of you might or might not be asking how uh, we could justify this dessert to which I referred. Three songs uh, from admittedly crude mass popular entertainment of Second Avenue. But the songs are good. So I'll tell you a couple things about that. First of all, Arthur Rubinstein, one of the giants of the piano of all time, was on a talk show. He was in his 80s, and for Arthur Rubinstein, he was at peak in his 80s, pianistically in every other way. Well, I don't know about every other way, but musically anyway. <laughs> Although, and <laughs> I didn't say anything. And um, I think it was David Frost the, in England who said, what about popular music? Do you like popular music? And Arthur Rubinstein said, look here, I like all good music. Jazz? Oh, if it's good jazz. You mean rock? If it's good rock. So rest assured that the songs I have picked from, um, sub, uh, from objective musical uh, analytic points of view would be considered by Arthur Rubinstein good melodies. Forget about the plays, they're silly, but the, these are good songs, musically. Then there's another thing, there is a tradition of this. Renata Tabaldi, certainly one of the greatest Italian sopranos of all time. I'm prejudiced, I think she was the greatest. But. And uh, I don't know if anyone remembers a thing called Lewiston Stadium. Yeah? It's another shame of New York, torn down. Lewiston Stadium was the New York Philharmonic summer concerts for free. It was, I don't know, I was a freshman in college or something like that, and uh, Renata Tabaldi was the soloist for the evening, and she sang Verdi and Puccini, and as an encore, she sang Rodgers and Hammerstein, If I Loved You, from Carousel. Now, of course, it came out like this. If I love the you. Okay. <laughs> but we all love the her, so it didn't matter. Yasha Heifetz. It would be very hard to argue that he's not among the five greatest violinists of all time. I mean, we have no recordings of Paganini, so okay. After a recital of Beethoven and Brahms and Bach and so forth, you know what he would play for encores? Yeah. He would play violin transcriptions of Irving Berlin songs, Porgy and Bess, Gershwin, things like that. So on and so forth. I mean, the last, in my view, the last of the great giants of the romantic pianist, Shira Sherkowski, when he got finished with a recital of Schumann and Balakirev and whatever it is, he, more than half the time, played the boogie-woogie as an encore. So if they can do it, so can we. But that's a dessert. It's a kind of programmed encore. My grandmother used to say, if you want dessert, you have to eat dinner first. So the dinner has first an on, you know, a main course, and before that, a fish course, and before that, an entree, and before that, some hors d'oeuvres. So I hope by now that you're all hungry.
der Katzen am Morgen hell, lecker noch, wie Gott sich krümmt. Wunder über Wunder, Gott mit ihm getroffen, wenn er hat gesungen, und dann sah ihm singen. Messias ist der Arsch von Frey gesprungen. Wunder über Wunder, er hat mit ihm getroffen, wenn er Hobobot gesungen hat, hat er so gesungen. Chiribim bam bam, chiribiri bam bam, chiribim bam bam.
Oh. <laughs> 
Mahe ingele nente zu mir und du a guck in die kleine Äusjela. Taiere Äusjela, gildene Äusjela. Gieche, gieche, um ahe. Zu mir, du a guck in die kleine Äußerlach, teilere Äußerlach, gildene Äußerlach, gieche, gieche, kummer. Hopp kann meuren, ich schreck sich nicht. Soi, set sich weg und her euch mit Kopf. Set sich, Otta soi, her sich zu. Kommt alle vor, kommt bis wo, kommt genug Gott. Come it's dale de do. Passer alle fa, passer bis ba, passer kimmel ga, passer dale da. Ota zoi ingele. Ota zoe daf min lenden jingle, oe ve taire jingle. Du a kuk in side un zog noch amol. 
kommt alles auf, kommt bis wo, hecke, starke, oh, wo. Und da soll auf mein Lernen jingle, ah, ah, ga, da. Hecke, starke, Da soll ich auf meine Hände jingle, aba, ga, da. Und da soll ich freiliche, lebendige, genarnig. Und da soll ich jingle, da. Teurer is die beste scheure. Was gewen a taie jingele, zult nie zijn kar genaalnik. Oi bist du a genaalnik jingele. Genoeg schoen, vermacht dem sude. Wenn wir dich fragen, was hast du getan in Schäde, sollst du sagen, Ostgelen teure, Gedenk teure, noch einmal teure, teure, teure. Wenn am Molaid mit a Jidene Katzon im Lach größer wie die Welt Hoben sie Techtala zwei Gehort Nur und a Groschen Geld Oi, wo ne bechotz na dann Die Techte chassene machen Herr, nur Herr, wo sie ist geschehen a mai se gonne zum lachen. Und euch schabes an eure Hul, eket men weite tir par ihm, und gewen is gewen. Eili Johannovi, greit an ihm, kum all das Hutz, das soll fahr ihm gebrochen. 
no hador til avek abroche i begelos en el milk taichen bei ren le kayam ote vido der gebra gewon tal bad sei lebel ni kam gain geda Ye come and is the grace is up for them hey them har oi skerun mir kun bein kuren nechtor atar ibn amolai mitayden katzon im lach groise vidi Oben seht der Schalach zwei gehört, nur ohne Groschen Spielt at the Simche, Tanz Hevre, Yachvalje in Yam, me huljet, me trinkt, um es liegt, hei, tenir hi, tenir hi, da, bei, tenir hi, tenir hi, da, bei, tenir hi, tenir hi, da, bei, tenir hi, tenir hi, da, er tanz mit der Fiedel in Rädel, Die Marsche liegt Hälfte zu Gram. Als Josel Kletner spielt auf dem Fiedel, dann Hefe, wie ach wohl je in Jam. Über hundertundzwanzig Es wird kommen, euch Josu schon zu gehen. Wetter fahren Kisse, Hakobe sich stellen. Allein und klein. Nur das Hevre wird ihm noch gesehen. Hei, Tainir Hi, Hei, Tainir Hi, Hei, Tainir Hi, Tainir Hi, Tainir Hi, Hot Hizer Josele Kvester. 
und tanzen wir, ach, weil ja hin jam. Hei, tei, dir, hi, tei, dir, hi, dam. 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 Geheißen Jedel, hat Jedel das Jedel gespielt auf der Fiedel. Fiedel, da Lidl, das Ohr, die mir Jedel. Was selber ein Jedel, aber singt in der Lidl. Dei, ja, da, 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 dei, da, ja, da. Bet in sein Weibele, Lieblinker Jedel. Fiedel dein Liedl mit Podium und Niedl, mir darf er Parnose, was teug mir dein Liedl, fähr mir das Schneidel, sei ja gut Liedl. Liedl, das Liedl mit Haarsaffen Fiedl, das Leben ist bitter, ohne sie. Ist das Liedl? Sagt ihm sein Weibele, schmeckt in Karriedel, Fiedel dein Liedl, am Matze mit Riedel. Ich red zu dir, Tachles, barrechen sich Liedl, erwähnt ihm dem Mittwoch, a Liedl. Fiedl, der Jedl, sein Lied auf ein Fiedl, voll alle Parnasse, es gefällt mir das Lied. Zorn, sein Weibele, Jedl, du Jedl, dein Weibele jammert und du singt ein Lied. Händel tun Händel der Lied auf dem Fiedel. Ich kann mir nicht helfen, mein Leben ist Fiedel. Als Eife das Liedl schon bleiben vergiegelt. Das Weibele teilt, das jedele Fiedel, du Liedl, der jed mit dem Fiedl. Ohne mehr ist der Liedl, das Schöne, das Liedl. Ei, ja, da, da, 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 da,
Bist du mit mir bräugst, weiß ich nicht, fahr was. Du gehst a ganzen Tag herum, a ruckel aus der Nuss. Tara, 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 tara. Äffchen willst du wissen, zu ich hab dich lieb. Lass mich bei der Rebe fahren zu dem Kind. Dann 
Welle die Käufe, na sei ge una kind. Una kleine Vogel, na sei ge una kind. Oh, sei schön, Herr, ein trauriges und gret auf dich zum Tee. No. Um sechzig Jahre. Batuste von Vera Kehr. Da 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 da. Schwuß, 
die Katz euch gelegt, die Putten, und ist geblieben und ablegen sie.
hab es mir geschenkt, wusst es ich nicht trag. Ich sog dir ganz prost, sie wissen, als die Host, an eie Mensch bin mir gemacht. Die Host hat in Karan geworfen, ihr Egel. Die Hotze steht jetzt ganz mein Leben hinter mir. Ich kann das nicht verstehen, wie es kein Geschenk, wie es wundert mir und schön. Ich verlor mir das Schmeidel mit den alten Kleiden, zu machen als ein Eindruck vor auf Sie bin in euch zu retten, mein Herz. Zu retten ich von Sinnen, zu retten ich von Schmerz. Ich leid von der Krankheit, wo es heißt nicht kein Krieg. Er leid auch zu retten, wo er noch gewinnt. Was gewinnt? Schon a week, jede Schor, jede Schor. Den Neu vergeht in der Reihe. Und wir können dich bringen mit zurück. Weil was gewinnt, 
is given is the door. The craft and very swords, the hair they grow. While was given, is given, is Fire, 